recent movies that you have ever seen that you learned a lesson from? What's one of the most recent movies you've seen that you learned a valuable lesson from? I want you to turn to somebody close to you that is not your spouse, boyfriend, or girlfriend. Somebody other than that. And tell them what the movie was and what you learned. You have 45 seconds. Do it. <laughs> Blindside, and that movie is the, the power of love to transform the lives of others. Since it's Rodeo Weekend, I had to throw in Open Range. Okay, Open Range. What a great, great movie. Besides the scenery, how about, man, ooh, the crusty old cowboy whose heart is softened by the love of a woman. Once again, the transforming power that love has. You see, good movies impact us, and then when movies get critiqued and reviewed, my understanding is that there are six categories that guys like Siskel and Ebert would use to critique or evaluate a movie. The six categories are setting, characters, point of view, plot. Plot always has conflict in it, and when there's conflict, then there must be number five, resolution and then the overriding theme of the movie. It was uh, Randy Frazee, who was the one who was the brainchild behind what we're going through, the story, who, as he was preaching the series the very first time, came up with the idea that chapter 14 would be a great chapter to use that same list of, of categories to describe what was going on in the story that we do to critique a movie. And so let's look at these six areas a little bit and get an understanding of, of what they are. But just before I do, there was a, a bookmark that came out many years ago from a, a quote with Jonathan Swift on it that said, I wish for you to live 
every day of your life. I wish for you to live every day of your life. And I trust that as a result of looking at chapter 14 in the story, that you will choose to live every day of your life in making right decisions. Because that's what we're going to discover as we critique and review chapter 14 of the story. The six categories of evaluating a story or a movie or a drama. First category is settings. Settings. That's the places or the circumstances where the story is taking place. The second area of critique is the characters. Who are the main characters and who are the sub-characters that add value to the story? The next setting is the point of view. From which point of view is the story being told? How many of you saw the movie Vantage Point? Vantage Point. It wasn't a big flake, all right? But Vantage Point. That was a movie where they kept showing the same scene again and again and again, but from a different character's vantage point. And what a difference there was, there were in each of those vantage points. Then there is the plot. Every good story, every good drama, every good movie has a conflict that arises in the story that causes great conflict. And any time there's great conflict, that takes us to the fifth element in critique, and that is resolution. A good story, a good movie, a good drama is brought to resolution and some conclusion. How many of you remember the Twilight Zone? 90% of those never ended. You remember that? They just got out there and it stopped, and, and you just, you had no idea what happened. I quit watching Twilight Zone because I got tired of being frustrated, all right? We want resolution. And then finally, the biggest idea is the theme. What's the overarching theme of this story? Usually there's multiple things, but what is the key primary theme? For example, what do you think was the overriding theme of the movie Shawshank Redemption? What was that, Corey? You got it! It was redemption! How many of you have seen the movie Shawshank Redemption? How many of you have not seen it? Raise your hand. You have not read the movie this week. Alright, phenomenal movie. Alright, Shawshank Redemption. And the theme of that one is, literally, redemption. For teaching chapter 14 of this story, uh, we are going to look at this chapter, and the title of it is, A Kingdom Torn in Two. When I decided that I would follow this approach for looking at this particular chapter and we would do these six elements of critique, uh, I thought, I wonder what this would look like up on a movie theater marquee. Do, do you all remember in, in the old days when we would go to the movie theater and there would always be the main movie and then there would be a secondary movie? You got two for the price of one. Remember? Y'all were old enough to remember that, right? Most of you, you pass your shake in his head now. But I can see, I can see it up there. A kingdom torn in two. Second feature, Texas Chainsaw Massacre. I mean, they both sound like thrillers and horror movies, all right? Uh, how many of you remember uh, the Wax Museum? I got a few hands going up, all right. Awesome, awesome horror movie back in the late 60s, early 70s. But anyway, kingdom torn in two. It's a thriller. First of all, let's look at the setting of this part of the story. It's found in 1 Kings chapter 12 through 16. But as we get to the exact setting, let's look at the background setting that leads up to this. This is our review of the story that brings us up to today. The big idea, God wants to live in community. He does so within His own nature. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, the triune God, live in community with each other. And the triune God had a vision to live in community with those that were made in His image. That's you and me. But the first two people in His community, Adam and Eve, they ended up choosing a different vision than God's vision. And as a result, they went in an opposite direction and the earth has been lost ever since. As we've said before, the rest of the Bible, story upon story, tells us the extent that God is willing to go to get us back into community with Him. The story out of the Bible from Genesis chapter 4 to Revelation chapter 21 is basically God's relentless pursuit of us. God wants us back. 
And as the story is beginning to unfold in the book of Genesis, one major thing that God does is He creates a brand new nation out of nothing. And it's from the nation that He'll reveal His grand plan to get us all back. We call this new nation the Chosen Family. Now we must remember that seven years transpired from the time that God called the first person of the new nation, Abraham, until they actually were settled in the promised land called Canaan. After getting settled in the land of Canaan for a little while, we see that the people of Israel asked if they could have a human king. They just didn't want God to be their king. They said, we want a king like all the other nations. I've got to stop right here and ask a question. My wife tells me that I say king funny. Yes, <laughs> that was not the answer I was hoping for. Back to the sermon. <laughs> How else do you say king? <laughs> That's what I said. King. <laughs> Well, why did they put it there then? <laughs> if you don't have a G, it's Kim. You don't. It's not Kim, it's King. <laughs> From the English woman. Here a Brit trying to tell me how to talk to her. <laughs> okay, so she's right and I'm wrong. Oh, my gosh, wrong. Not the first time. <laughs> settled in the land of Canaan for a while, they said, hey, we want a human king just like other nations. Now I'm going to think about it. Every time I say that, I'm going to think about it. And even though this was not in the perfect will of God, God allows this in his permissible will for Israel to have a king. This period of the Bible is called the era of the kings. There are three monarchs <laughs> Three monarchs of Israel. Saul, a king like other nations had. David, a king who had a heart after God. And Solomon, the wisest man who ever lived, who lived so foolishly. The wisest man who ever lived, but who lived so foolishly. These monarchs were ruling over the 12 tribes of Israel. Dan, Judah, Gad, Manasseh, Benjamin, all the 12 tribes. Saul, that first one was from the tribe of Benjamin. But David and Solomon are from the tribe of Judah. And that's very important to remember as we continue on our journey through the story. Toward the end of Solomon's reign, he gets very aggressive with building projects, including the building of vast ships. And to pay for these excessive projects, guess what the politician does? He raises taxes. He forces them to participate in hard labor. Oh, I'm kicking things up here. I forgot where I was. He forces them into hard labor and high taxes. So when Solomon dies, his approval rating is very, very low with the people. And the throne is passed. To Solomon's, and this I did not know till this past week, and I'm still doing some research on it, but my research up to now still indicates this is correct. Solomon's only son, Rehoboam. Doing some reading, I came across the fact that Rehoboam was Solomon's only son. So I got out my concordance and I began to look it up. Solomon's sons. I got out my Bible dictionary and I looked it up. Only one listed is Rehoboam. I Googled it. The only son of Solomon is Rehoboam. Now think that through for just a moment. He had 700 wives. And the guy could only man up once to have one son. All the rest were girls. Amazing. I cannot find it all. If somebody can find one, please let me know. Because it was hard for me to believe. One. In fact, when I Googled Solomon's sons or sons of Solomon, you know what I found? I found bands and motorcycle gangs <laughs> called the Sons of Solomon. It was amazing. <laughs> and that's where our story picks up today. It's in chapter 14, 1 Kings 12 through 16, and that's the setting. Moving on to number two. How about the characters? There are two main characters in the story. One is Rehoboam, Solomon's only son, who takes over the throne from Solomon. Rehoboam is from the tribe of Judah. 
And then there is Jeroboam. He is from the tribe of Ephraim. Rehoboam. Jeroboam. I gotta be honest, I always thought as a kid growing up in Sunday school, I thought they were twin brothers. But they're not. They weren't even related. You get a sense that in those days, Rehoboam, Jeroboam, that must have been a cool thing to do in that day, was to name your kids Boam. Alright? Timmy Boam, Giga Boam, Gilla Boam, Mini Boam. I mean, wow! <laughs> Boam, that's it. <laughs> we first learn of Jeroboam in 1 Kings chapter 11. He's a very young man, and he is an officer in Solomon's cabinet. He was very successful in his endeavors, and he was a very, very capable young man. And a prophet comes along to this young Jeroboam, and he tells him that God is going to make him king. But not right now. But apparently Jeroboam, a young man, has not read the history about David, who God chose to be king when he was just a boy, and he could have stepped into the kingship sooner, but he waited for God's timing. Jeroboam that was not willing to do that, and he tried to usurp the throne away from Solomon. Solomon hears about it, and he attempts to kill Jeroboam. But Jeroboam escapes to Egypt. So there's the two main characters. Rehoboam, king and son and successor of Solomon. Jeroboam, officer in Solomon's cabinet, who rebels and flees the country. Bridges us number three, the point of view of the story. A story can be told from many points of view, but I'm going to start off from the point of view of the human story, or we've been calling that in this series, the lower story. We've talked about upper and lower story and how a, 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 an ordinary person in that time would have seen the unfolding of this part of the story from the horizontal perspective. At all times in God's story, there's parallel stories running at the very same time. Upper story, that's the story from God's perspective. Lower story, that's the story from our own perspective. The upper story is the grand plan of God to get us back. The upper story is that one big, powerful, seamless story that we're trying to uncover in this journey as we go through the Old and the New Testament. The upper story, the will of God and His sovereign plan. Then there's the lower story. That's the stuff that happens in the everyday adventure of life. That's the paying of bills, the finding and working of jobs. That's our hopes and our dreams. That's our sinus problems and fixing dinner. That's mowing the lawn and building relationships. That's what happens on the lower level of the story. The lower story is the stuff of daily lives. As we're reading the Bible, these two stories, upper and lower, are parallel. Initially, I want to explain how this particular chapter looked from the vantage point of the lower story. That is how it would be perceived by the person watching from a horizontal perspective. This is the person that would have been interviewed by the Jerusalem Post about the unfolding of this particular plot. That brings us then to number four, the plot of the story. With every good story, like every good movie, like every good drama, there's a conflict that arises and the cost of that conflict is revealed. You can turn to page 193 in your storybook, if you would like, or you can turn in your regular Bible to 1 Kings chapter 12, verses 1 through 14. But you'll find this on page 193 in the story, and let's read about the conflict and the plot. Here we go. Page 193, first paragraph that's not in italics. Rehoboam went to Shechem, for all Israel had gone there to make him king. When Jeroboam, son of Nebat, heard this, he was still in Egypt, where he had fled from King Solomon. He returned from Egypt. So they sent for Jeroboam, and he and the whole assembly of Israel went to Rehoboam, and they said to him, Your father put a heavy yoke on us, but now lighten the harsh labor and the heavy yoke. Reduce the taxes, and we will serve you. Rehoboam answered, Go away for three days, and then come back to me. So the people went away. Then King Rehoboam consulted the elders who had served his father Solomon during his lifetime. How would you advise me to answer these people, he asked. They replied, If today you will be a servant to these people and serve them and give them a favorable answer, they will always be your servants. 
But Rehoboam rejected the advice the elders gave him and consulted the young men who had grown up with him and were serving him. He asked them, what is your advice? How should we answer these people who say to me, lighten the yoke your father put on us? The young men who had grown up with him replied, these people have said to you, your father put a heavy yoke on us, but make our yoke lighter. Now tell them, my little finger is thicker than my father's waist. My father laid on you a heavy yoke, I will make it even heavier. My father scourged you with whips, I will scourge you with scorpions. I think Rehoboam thought he was making a joke about their yoke, but I don't think so. <laughs> Three days later, Jeroboam and all the people returned to Rehoboam as the king had said, Come back to me in three days. And the king answered the people harshly. Rejecting the advice given him by the elders, he followed the advice of the young men and said, My father made your yoke heavy. I will make it even more heavy. My father scourged you with whips. I will scourge you with scorpions. So the king did not listen to the people. So there's your conflict. It appears at first glance that the unwise decision of Rehoboam to ignore the counsel of the elderly people who had served in the cabinet of his father Solomon had seen a lot of things unfold and he rejects their counsel and he receives the counsel of the younger men who grew up with him. It seems that this creates a major conflict. That moves us now to number five. What is the resolution of the conflict? We've looked at the setting, the character, the plot. And now we get to resolution. How is the conflict that Rehoboam apparently creates going to be resolved? If you look at page 194 of the story, or in 1 Kings 12, verses 16 and 17, the scripture tells us, When all Israel saw that the king refused to listen to them, they answered the king, What share do we have in David? What part do we have in Jesse's son? To your tents, Israel! Look after your own house! So the Israelites went home. But as for the Israelites who were living in the towns of Judah, Rehoboam still ruled over them. If you go to 1 Kings 12, 20, or page 195 of the story, you will see the scripture read some more. When all the Israelites heard that Jeroboam had returned, they sent and called him to the assembly, and they made Jeroboam king over all Israel. Only the tribe of Judah remained loyal to the house of David. So what's the resolution to the conflict? Divide the kingdom. Cut it in half. You know the irony I find in that? Do you remember Rehoboam's father, his first test to his wisdom that we studied last week? When two women came to him, Two hookers, two prostitutes came to him. One of them, both of them had babies. One of them rolled over in the night and smothered her child. So she buried the baby and claimed the other baby as her own. And those two women went to Solomon with the one baby and said, we both claim this is our child. And Solomon's wisdom said, let's cut this baby in half so it can be equal to both of you. And the one who really loved the baby said, let the other woman have them. No one loves God's chosen family enough to say, I'll take my hands away from being the king. They divided the kingdom. They were getting the wish of the people. They were acting just like other nations. Jeroboam takes ten of the tribes of Israel and forms a new nation, and that new nation is simply called Israel. But Rehoboam is to the south of the tribes of Judah and Benjamin. He remains king, not over all of Israel, but over a new nation called Judah. It's important for history that you remember this. Israel and Judah. Remember what happened here. If we change from the lower story of the people's view and we move to the upper story and try to see God's view, we will see something very, very different. If we look at the story from a lower perspective, what I just read looks fairly straight up. But if you move to the upper story and you see God's perspective, you're going to discover something quite different, something the average reader would miss. As it turns out, 
from this divine point of view, it wasn't in fact significantly Rehoboam's decision that caused this division. It was a decision that was made a generation before by his own father. There is a phrase I understand that's used in military aviation that goes something like this. The accident occurred already. We are just waiting for the plane to arrive at the crash site. Are you with me? The accident occurred already. We're just waiting for the plane to arrive. You see, this, this aviation expression refers to an accident that occurs either by a serious malfunction or an equipment failure or when a pilot or a member of the crew makes a poor decision. When they make that fa fatal decision, that's the point of the accident. We just have to wait for the accident to occur, but it's already been set in motion. And that is precisely what happened to the nation of Israel. Solomon, King, the pilot of that ship, that plane, made some very serious and fatal decisions during his own reign that are very important to God and that guaranteed the crash of the nation. But it wouldn't happen right away. It didn't happen when he made the decision. It was going to happen much later. It's going to take several years after Solomon is already ejected from the plane before the plane of Israel crashes at the crash site. And I want to back up and remind you of one other thing. The reason it did not happen in Solomon's reign is because of some good decisions that were made by his father in the previous generation. God had told David, David, because you have a heart like mine, you're not perfect, but you have a heart that wants what I want. Because of your heart, your son is going to rule during a time of peace and prosperity. And God keeps his word. Now Solomon doesn't have a heart like God, and so he makes some decisions that's going to bring about a crash in the future generation. Why? Because God kept his word to the previous. You see, what I hope you get is you get nothing else out of today's story is this. Decisions that we make do not only impact us. It impacts others in the sphere of influence in your story. <clears throat> We see it with David impacting Solomon. Solomon blessed because of David. Rehoboam, tragedy, not only of his own making, but also because of Solomon's <coughs> doing. Back to 1 Kings 11, 1 to 6. If you want to go back to the previous chapter of the story, page 191, it tells us about this. We read it last week. And it says this, King Solomon, he loved many foreign women besides Pharaoh's daughter. Moabite women, Ammonites, Edomites, Sidonians, Hittites, they were from nations about which the Lord had told Israel, you are not to intermarry with them because they will turn your heart after other gods. Nevertheless, Solomon held fast to them in love. 700 wives of royal birth and 300 concubines. I don't know about you, but that's too many. <laughs> and it's too many. And his wives led him astray as Solomon grew old, and he grew old before his time, guys. His wives turned his heart after other gods. His heart was not devoted to the Lord as the heart of David his father had been. He followed Ashtoreth, the goddess of the Sidonians, Moloch, the detestable god of the Ammonites. So Solomon did evil in the eyes of the Lord, and he did not follow God completely as David his father had done. Now skip down a little farther, page 192, verses 9 through 13 of chapter 11 of 1 Kings. The Lord became angry with Solomon because his heart had turned from the Lord, the God of Israel, who had appeared to him twice. Although he had forbidden Solomon to follow other gods, Solomon did not keep this command. So the Lord said to Solomon, Since this is your attitude and you have not kept my covenant and my decrees, which I commanded you, I will most certainly tear away the kingdom from you and give it to one of your subordinates. Nevertheless, for the sake of David, your father, I will not do it during your lifetime. I will tear it out of the hand of your son. Yet I will not tear the whole kingdom from him, but I will give him one tribe for the sake of David, my servant, and for the sake of Jerusalem, which I have chosen. When Rehoboam, the son of Solomon, hears that Jeroboam has formed a brand new nation, taking the majority, ten of the tribes of Israel, and has become their king. Rehoboam wants to fight. He wants to go to battle, and he calls the army. 
But the Lord intervenes and he says directly to Rehoboam, page 195 in your storybook, he says to Rehoboam, do not go up and fight against your brothers, the Israelites. Go home, every one of you, for this, this is my doing. God says, Rehoboam, you may think the decision you made is what caused this division. It's not. I am behind this division because of what I challenged your daddy with. It looks like a poor decision, and yes, it was. But this poor decision your father made set this in motion a long time ago. It wasn't Rehoboam's decision in the lower story, but God's decision in the upper story that caused the division of Israel. It doesn't change the theme of this story, but it does deepen the severity of the theme. And that brings us to number six in critiquing a movie or a story, and that is the theme. What's the overriding theme? Every story has one major theme. What's this one? I believe all of you would agree that the theme must have something to do with the consequences of decisions. Let's put it this way. We make decisions, and those decisions turn around and make us. Let me say that one again. We make decisions, and those decisions turn around and shape us. There's a second phrase, and that is the stakes go up if you are a leader of any kind because everyone else around you is brought into the results of your decision. If you're a parent, if you're a spouse, you have leadership roles. If you're involved in the community or at work or in church, you have leadership roles of some kind. And so the decisions we make not only impact us, but others around us, as David and Solomon and Rehoboam are teaching us. It's true from the lower story that the decision that Rehoboam made to listen to the younger counsel and not to the elderly is a poor decision. It's like the mother who says to the child who's just succumbed to peer pressure at school and has gotten into some sort of trouble, if your friends told you to jump off the bridge, would you? Some kids have said yes. Rehoboam was the king's son, and now he's the king himself. He wields an enormous amount of popularity with his generation. He asked a lot of guys he grew up with who now are part of his advisory cabinet, what do you think they're going to say? They're going to say what Rehoboam wants to hear. God did not make Rehoboam choose the path. He knew this path was in the heart of Rehoboam already. I believe that God used Rehoboam's immaturity in the lower story to accomplish his will in the upper story. Folks, as Christian leaders, whether as parents or in the marketplace or church or school, we are called upon to get our lives in sync with the overall plan of God's upper story. We are to lead people that we serve in the direction by the decisions that we make. Just as Ola May Laughlin made some decisions about wearing, and this was their term, guys, so don't get upset, hooker earrings on Wednesdays for their cancer treatment. Big Alan, what for? To put a smile on their faces going through bad circumstances. And as I visited with some of those ladies afterwards, it says, Ola never missed a chance to say, because people ask, Ola, how can you, you were given six months. How did you make it eight years? She kept telling folks again and again, God's not finished with me yet. When God's finished with me, it'll be my time to go and I'm ready to go. But at what time He gives me, I am going to enjoy every ounce of life that He gives me breath to share. I love it. The decision she made impacted the lives of her family and her friends and others who were around. When Solomon made the decision to serve other gods and the people of Israel followed him, he was leading them into a disastrous division. His personal agenda, his personal loves, his personal lust, and his personal passion for foreign women who worship pagan gods cost the nation of Israel so very, very much. But folks, I want you to know it is not hopeless. There is the upper story of God. God has a plan and God has a promise to make a way for his people to be reunited him, re reunited with him in community. Remember, he wants us back. 
And he has a plan and he's made a promise. He promised in the upper story that one day he would provide a Messiah through the nation of Israel. And not just through Israel, but specifically through the tribe of Judah out of the city of Bethlehem. And not just through the tribe of Judah and the city of Bethlehem, but from the line and the family of David. So no matter how detestable Solomon's actions were, it does not thwart the plan of God. There's lots of consequences for the Israelites in the lower story, but the upper story marches on. Judah must prevail, regardless of the detestable decisions of Solomon. Not because Solomon deserved it, but because God made a promise to all of us. As we'll see in these next few weeks, we continue on in the story. The ten tribes that followed Jeroboam and formed the northern kingdom of Israel were ultimately captured by the pagan Assyrians, never to be reassembled as a nation of people again. They are referred to in history as the lost tribes of Israel. It is the southern tribe of Judah which experienced 250 years of difficulties under the divided kingdom, mostly due to poor leadership. They had seven years of captivity under the pagan rulers of the Babylonians. They reassemble in Jerusalem and they go strong again as God continues His plan of sending Jesus to be born out of them. This does not happen because they deserve it. It happens because God made a promise and the upper story depends upon it. If you read the books of 1st and 2nd Kings, you'll read the stories that we're talking about. Matter of fact, we're getting most of what we're talking about today from 1st Kings. But there's also the books of 1st and 2nd Chronicles. Do I say Chronicles okay? Yeah. All right. All right. And they're basically looking at the same events, but from a different point of view. It's interesting when you look at 1 Chronicles 13, because it does not contain all the kings of the north and the south. 1st Kings does. 1 Kings has all the many kings of the divided kingdom, both north and south. But Chronicles contains only the stories of the southern kings. Why? Because the southern kings are the remnant that God is using to continue to unveil the promise where the Messiah will come from. The southern kings, even in their poor leadership, are really a part of what matters. The upper story is bringing to the world a Messiah who would change the world. So... With the theme being considered, the movie comes to a close. There'll be a sequel, but not today. It's like the Rocky movie. There'll be another one. Yeah. Stallone lives long enough. I'm sure there'll be another one. He'll fight from the Rocky chair. But do you remember Rocky won when he lost to a split decision to Apollo Creed? There was another Rocky movie for sure, and he would triumph. But that movie's not for today. The credits begin to roll. The lights are coming up. It's time for us to go home. As we walk out of this place and we head to our cars, we ponder the impact of this story, this drama on our own lives, and on the lives who are members of the body of Christ. And we ask, what kind of impact has this story had on me? Just like we did when we watched The Bucket List, or Dan in Real Life, or The Notebook, this theme rings loud and clear, I hope, for all of us. We make decisions, and decisions make us. If we're leaders, the stakes go up because as a leader, we bring everyone under the results of our decision. So as the credits are ready to roll, the lights are coming up, and we're ready to walk to our car and ponder the impact on our lives, we need to make this personal. How am I making decisions? Upper story or lower story perspective? How will the decisions I make impact others under my care? How could it possibly affect people into the future that I haven't even met yet? My grandchildren, their spouses. How is the decision that we're faced with right now going to affect not only the people that we see right now, but the people we don't see who are coming after us? Are you making decisions for your own life and for people around you that you lead? Are they in sync with the upper story of God and what His desire is to accomplish? We are followers of Christ. 
We're part of the ongoing story of God. His upper story as he carries it out in this world. For the Israelites, everything in their life should have been synced up with the first coming of Jesus Christ to provide a Messiah to the world, to restore us and unite us. God paying the price to get us back. We are the church. And everything in our personal lives and in our corporate lives, our professional world, how we live as believers should focus on Jesus coming back to live within us and restore us to himself. The central mission that we have is to sync our life up with his life in us. Now some of you listening to these words are pondering the impact of the story. At this very moment, you are living in a season of division. You are in a moment of division in a relationship, in a marriage, in your family, between generations. Maybe a division in your fellowship. Some poor decisions have already been made. The plane has or will soon arrive at the crash site. And it's painful to watch, but many generations may be impacted because of our personal passions, because of our personal lusts, because of things we're doing outside the will of God. If you're the one responsible for making such a decision, the call of God on your life today is for us to humble ourselves and first of all, Make it right with Him. It's the right thing to do. And maybe if we do that, we'll avoid the crash. But even if we can't avoid the crash, it is the right thing to do. And there's hope beyond the crash if we make the right decision. <coughs> One of the many kings in the north and the south that followed the reign of Solomon, only five of them were godly men. Be a godly person. Don't, don't be like Solomon. Be like David. Be a, a just